there's an IPAM for organizing where there's good conference here, they usually are good conferences. So uh, this is work done at Penn State. The, uh, my current group is listed in uh, lighter blue. Uh, the people who worked on the experiment that I'll be talking about are Laura Zundell, Josh Wilson, and you know, Albania, and in the not too distant past, uh, Lynn Gia and uh, Jean Felix Roux, and also Aaron Reinhardt and Kurt Warren or Toshia Kenshi in the past. Supported by uh, NSF for a long time, Dark and Arrow and so on. So the motivation for, uh, for this work is that uh, if you have a, a many body system, isolated many body system, we know that as far as it, uh, it appears sort of uh, generically, it looks like it thermalized. That is, it approaches a highest entropy state. There's a microcanonical distribution that is what it typically has. So you have some observable over some time, it approaches the answer you can get from statistical mechanics. And, uh, and that, if it's an isolated system, it only depends on the total energy, what the final state is going to be. But if you have an integrable system, those are an exception, because there are a lot of extra conserved quantities. And uh, the extra conserved quantities make, make it so that you can't generically go to the statistical mechanical answer. You have to typically use a generalized Gibbs ensemble to go to, to what the, the uh, final distribution is. So the question that I'm really trying to ask is what happens around this integral point? You know, is it singular? Is it is that the only place that quantum statistical mechanics doesn't apply for an isolated system, or is there some region around that singular point, which is uh, where you still can't trust statistical mechanics? And that's the, so the big picture question we're trying to answer. So what I'll do is I'll start off talking about some uh, the systems that we use, the one uh, D Bose gases, how we make them, and the like. And then uh, I'll explain uh, out of equilibrium gases and talk about quantum Newton's cradle. Well, not, not for a lot, I figured there's probably some general knowledge of what they are. And show that, that we, you have to a pretty good approximation these integral systems don't thermalize. I'll have a little bit of a theoretical side uh, note uh, to sort of expand upon this question about whether something might be happening near that integral point particularly centered around the eigenstate normalization hypothesis. And then for what's uh, maybe the latter third to a half of the talk, I'll show how we are looking for the onset of normalization in this nearly integral system. Okay, so we use optical lattices to trap atoms. Uh, you don't have to know a whole lot about the way they work other than if you just imagine what does the intensity look like as a function of position, that's the shape of these atom traps. That's the way the dipole uh, traps work. So the simplest thing would be a focused laser beam will trap atoms at the, uh, at the focus if they're cold enough. Uh, an optical lattice is just using the interference of light with itself to give you more complicated shape traps. So a one-dimensional standing wave can trap you a stack of pancakes. If you have a two-dimensional standing wave, you get a bundle of tubes. And uh, if you have a three-dimensional standing wave, you get an array of points like a, like a crystal lens. Now, one of the reasons I showed this slide is because in my group for things that I'm not going to be talking about, there are a bunch of experiments that use all these different kinds of lattices. So we're, we are searching for the electron electric dipole moment using atoms in a trap like this. I'll talk about some 1D Bose gas experiments, but we do other experiments with uh, atoms in a trap like that. And then we're using uh, a three-dimensional trap with neutral atoms in it to try to uh, make a neutral atom quantum computer. I say as an aside, because it seems especially relevant for this audience, I, I claim that what we have now, we're pretty much close to demonstrating a Maxwell demon for 50 atoms, where the operation of this demon is that it uses the information that we get from looking at the distribution of uh, atoms in these sites, and that's the largest entropy by a, a fair amount in the system, and then through a series of reversible steps, it manifestly uh, Gives you, gives you something which is uh, has sort of obviously lower entropy and you could extract work from it. That's not what I'm going to talk about, although I'd be happy to talk about that offline. I'll be talking about this experiment, these uh, quantum Newton's cradles. So there, just to, to uh, give you a sense, we have a, uh, an optical lattice, a 2D optical lattice, which gives us this bundle of tubes. And those are very big lattice beams, so all the tubes are basically the same as every other tube. Uh, we cap the tubes 
with a red deuterium trap. So, so the lattice is uh, blue, so the atoms are trapped in the, uh, in the nodes. We cap the trap with this cross dipole trap, which uh, just uh, keeps them from, it's a somewhat anharmonic trap in the axial direction. And uh, as just as uh, Jorgen talked about earlier, it's one dimensional because all the energies are less than the vibrational spacing. And uh, in this case, it's a bundle of tubes is one dimensional because there's negligible tunneling. The, the lattices are deep enough for all the experiments I'm going to be describing that there's just not significant tunneling as part of any of the dynamics. So there are a bunch of independent one dimensional tubes. Uh, this system uh, realizes the uh, lead linear model, which is just a, uh, a 1D gas with uh, variable strength delta function interactions and a, and a kinetic energy term for every particle. It was solved in, uh, by Lieben Linger in 1963, where the solutions are parameterized by this uh, gamma parameter, just depends upon the, uh, the strength of the scattering, the 1D density, and other constants in the problem. Uh, it's an iterable model, so there are many conserved quantities, and the wave functions, although it's not trivial to do, wave functions and all local properties can be exactly calculated. Uh, Maxime Moshani, who's here, is actually he's here. He came down from the upper uh, upper reaches to be on the main floor for this talk. I feel <laughs> happy about that. Uh, he uh, showed how if you have an atom and a wave guide, that uh, using you know a real three-dimensional atom occupying some wave guide, it maps onto the Lieblinger model with pretty high reliability. <clears throat> right, and uh, I mean this approxim. I mean anyway, it's it's a good approximation. That this is a uh, the Lieblinger gas that you implement. And there's been many experiments in my group and elsewhere about these Lieblinger gases. I just give one example of them, which is uh, by photo association, we measure the local pair correlation function as a function of the coupling strength. So if you go from weak coupling, the gas, the correlations look more like a BC, which would be uh, a G2 of 1. And then if there's strong coupling, the, the uh, atoms look more like uh, fermions. And there's a poly exclusion like principle that particle overlap is very unlikely. Why is it sterile? It, it's, uh, it's experimental detail. It's just we, when we change the color, we change the density. But within a given color, we're just changing the, the uh, strength of the trap. So, so this so, is basically for temperature t equals zero, or? This is for temperature that's pretty close to t equals zero. zero. So the calculations for t equals zero. Or? That the calculations for t equals zero, and there's not any free parameters in doing it. Yeah. Because uh, it turns out that there are some subtleties that you're trying to do, this is trying to bring this for a field. When you're trying to do uh, things like momentum measurements, not being at t equals zero is a big deal. But for the local properties, it looks, it's yeah. pretty robust against having a slightly elevated temperature. Okay, so that's equilibrium gases, pretty well understood, equilibrium model, and, and you know that's the other thing I, I mean to show here is that we have a very good idea of what's in this system, right? Without free parameters, you can get the prediction just realized in the lab. So you say we are realizing something close to the equilibrium model. So taking it out of equilibrium, the first thing to consider is just two particles that are colliding <coughs> in one dimension, and if they're identical particles, you can't tell whether they reflected or whether they went through each other, and uh, because it's the only way to conserve energy and momentum is if they either exchange and do one of those two things. There's no other possibility. So if you just have two body collisions, you can't change the momentum distribution. Now, it's a little bit more complicated in an interacting gas. You know, for instance, if you have a Thomas Fermi gas, as atoms expand, the mean field energy will be converted into kinetic energy. But it does this in this integrable way where, uh, where it's nothing like thermalization. And if you have a uh, toxic oil gas, which is say you're in the strong coupling limit, then what starts off as a bosonic kind of momentum distribution with a peak in the middle, as it expands, evolves into something which looks fermionic. I'd say we've been doing some other experiments that I'm not going to talk about on this dynamical fermionization, and you can see pretty uh, pretty well that that's actually what happens. You know, the bosonic distribution converts into a uh, pretty rapidly converts into a fermionic distribution. So, integral gases uh, don't thermalize, and um, the uh, the reason is, and if you're looking at it from the point of view of collisions, is that you can't have not just two body 
diffractive collisions or where two momentum go into two different momentum. You also can't have three momentum going into three different momentum. Right? That is, there are no diffractive collisions. It's only these non-diffractive collisions where essentially nothing happens in that interaction. That's a feature of the integrability, which it's relatively easy to see with the delta function potential, but any integral action would be like that. You know, you can even, it's uh, many people have attempted to just define that as being the feature of an integral many way system. So in this case, they uh, they don't thermalize. There's many ways to say it. There might be subtle differences. I'm not going to worry about those subtle differences here. What we're really asking is that if you have a real 1D Bose gas, which is not exactly integral because it's not an exact uh, an, an exact mapping onto this uh, Lee Linegar model, will it thermalize? Are there those imperfections enough to make the thing thermalize? So the procedure that we followed is to take the gas out of take all the gases out of equilibrium, and then just watch how they evolve. We do that in this uh, case where all the bundle of twos, we pulse on two uh, standing waves that uh, diffracts the atoms, and you get all the atoms in a superposition of, half go of halfway going this way and halfway going this way within a tube. And uh, that's called a quantum Newton's cradle because it's like this Newton's cradle, except for that the particles don't always bounce off each other, they are in a superposition of going through each other and bouncing off each other most of the time. What it looks like if you take a picture is this. So this is a picture roughly in momentum space. Uh, so in real space, it's 90 degrees out of phase. The one uh, side of, uh, you know, the one group evolves like this, the other group evolves like this. And over time, after about 15 cycles, and then a couple hundred milliseconds, what the distribution looks like is just the same as if you just stack all these on top of each other. That is, the, the atoms dephase within each tube so that uh, there is no evolution on this oscillation time scale. It's just a steady state distribution. And then mostly what we're doing is we're looking at that steady distribution, state distribution and seeing how it evolves over time, uh, ultimately as a way to tell about thermalization. So from our original data a decade ago, we uh, th these are the curves, just the, the uh, sum of these curves, if you integrate in this way and plot them up that way, uh, what the distributions look like. So this is the D-phase distribution in blue, and after some time you get the red distribution. Uh, you can show that there's some loss associated with, at that point, we didn't exactly know what the process was, uh, and there's a little bit of heating. And if we try to just naively account for that heating, we saw that the uh, the uh, blue curve would evolve into the red curve after that time, which is to say it didn't seem like there was any evidence of thermalization. Now, because we didn't know exactly what all the details of what was going on with this uh, heating, all we could do is set, a, set a, an upper limit. It, the the uh, thermalization rate couldn't be any greater than uh, some amount. There's thousands of these, of these uh, two-body collisions without any thermalization. All right, so you have a steady state, which is obviously manifestly not an equilibrium result, which is much more like a Gaussian here. And, uh, and if you want to think about what's going on sort of semi-classically, it's a G particles in here moving with the amplitude that it had to begin with, just out of phase with all the other particles. In fact, this sort of semi-classical view is what we'll largely be using because it turns out that the interaction energy left off in the gas is just a few percent of the total energy, right? The vast majority of the energy is just the kinetic energy we gave it in the Newton's cradle. Right, so if this gas were to thermalize, it would be a thermal gas. You know, it would be well into being a thermal gas. Okay, uh, you might say, well, okay. But it if, it's if it's defaced, it looks like a thermal gas. Right? Hmm? If it's defaced inside the tube, it also looks like a thermal gas. Right? Uh, yeah, it, it's, it's just like, that. Well, it looks like a classical no, gas. With a specific but the, the problem is that you could be in, in a um, in a point where uh, I mean, the point I'm making here is that the density is such that the residual interaction energy, which even if it's a thermal gas, could be a substantial amount of the total energy, is small. Yeah. Right. So you don't have to worry about those interactions when you're looking at the yes. interaction to a large degree. And then when we measure it, we take that energy away as well. Okay. So. There are collisions that are happening because if you do the same thing just without the tubes and you collide two groups of atoms together in uh, just what turns out to be about three collisions per particle, 
the atoms thermalize, and you see here after nine oscillations, even though the density is much lower in this case than it is in the tubes where they're really tightly confined together, it does thermalize. Okay, so the question again we're, we're going to be asking now is we've seen that it mostly doesn't thermalize, but will it ever eventually start to thermalize? Or what, what will it do? Okay, so that brings me into this sort of uh, theoretical aside part of it, where uh, a problem which is closely related, I say, to what we're trying to uh, accomplish is uh, things related to the classical KM theorem, where uh, what was shown through a series of theoretical work is that if you have a non-integrable system that's close enough to integrable, then uh, it doesn't require to be sample phase space. You have to get to a significant, significantly uh, a large enough amount of non-integrability before you'll have chaos and you can actually get microcanonical distributions. And thinking about that as a background, also uh, for an isolated system, focused uh, my mind and other people's mind on a problem that had been considered uh, for a time uh, for a long time before that. How is it that any quantum system? quantum system ever thermalizes. A right? generic description of a closed quantum system is you sum over all the eigenstates, there's some wave function which is very complicated, there's some amplitude which is just a complex number for each wave function, and there's a Bohr phase. And that's the entirety of the, of the uh, time evolution of your closed quantum system. And so you know, it's, it's com more complicated than it looks, but the notable thing is that these A sub i, and there's a lot of them because it's a Hilbert space size number of uh, eigenstates, don't ever change. They clearly, forever, for this isolated kind of system, retain the memory of the initial distribution. So how is it that the thing, that systems, like I said at the beginning, they look like they thermalize? Well, if you look at a simple observable over a long time, then the off-diagonal matrix element just fluctuate. You know, whatever they started off being, they fluctuate and there'll be some noise associated, but the things that won't fluctuate are the diagonal matrix elements, which will come to we'll have some steady value. So the expectation value for simple observable is just the sum weighted by the weight of that eigenstate of all these expectation values that are observable for each of those eigenstates. So in order for it to be that any of these superpositions is going to look like the thermal, the uh, thermodynamic result, the statistical mechanical result, it has to be that all the eigenstates look just like a thermal state, at least as far as measuring the expectation value of uh, simple observables. Right, so that's the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, which is that if the thing will always look like it thermalizes, it has to be that the eigenstates look thermal in the ways that you can measure those eigenstates. Now, one um, interesting way to see this is uh, things that, uh, that uh, Marcos Rigol, my colleague, has uh, done, before he was my colleague, uh, where first he did simulations of, uh, of uh, non-integrable Hamiltonians, so atoms on a 5x5 uh, five five lattice, and uh, these are exact solutions for the expectation value of the zeroth order mode of a distribution uh, as a function of the energy of the state. And you see that for states around the same energy, they all have about the same uh, expectation value for that observable. Right, so if you have all your eigenstates sort of bunched around this point, then after a long time, you will measure that uh, value, and that value will be the uh, statistical mechanics result, which would be hugged through the center of that line. Whereas if you have an integrable system, like uh, near, nearest neighbor interactions only on a, uh, on a uh, or, or on-site interactions on a 13-site on a uh, site chain, and you do the exact ionization, the eigenstates are all over the place. So here, obviously, if you start off weighted down to the bottom of this distribution, then in the infinite time, that's the answer that you'll get. It won't be the positional mechanics result. Right? So because of this large spread of where the actual uh, eigenvalues are, you don't expect that this system will, will generally thermalize. You can do something to make it so it's not thermalized. And then the question about what happens for a slightly non integrable system, where there's been a fair amount of work, but the problem is that it's hard to get a large enough system that you can be confident, fully confident that what's happening is uh, is a, not a finite size effect. So the question we're really trying to answer is what, what's happening in between these regimes. And one way that I like to think about this conceptually is if I look at the exudation values of the observables across uh, all the eigenstates that are available, 
I know that if if I have some non-integrability parameter and it's large, all these states are going to hug the line. It's going to maybe get the statistical mechanical result. But if I'm totally integrable, there's going to be some spread in all generality. And uh, what I get is going to uh, depend upon the initial conditions. So the question really is, you know, how does it go from here to here? Right? Is it a, some sort of smooth process? Is it just a little bit of non-integrability and then it collapses onto a line? And I would say, you know, physically, it's not so clear which of those it is. It is clear that if you have an answer like this, the ETH tells you what the answer is at even at infinite time, even though you can't do experiments at infinite time, it turns out. But, uh, but anyway, this is the nature of the question. And you might say, well, for an infinite system, it could be that uh, we only need uh, epsilon non-integrability. I just add, I note here that this large spread of the, of the observables uh, across different eigenstates is true also for an infinite system, right? It, you know, there's already an infinity built into, uh, into this little picture. Okay, so now I'm going to start in about what is happening in our experiment and how we're going to look at it. And it turns out that the first term that's going to lead to, to thermalization, going to lead to diffractive free body collisions in these 1D gases is if there's a virtual excitation to an excited state. So you don't have enough energy for two particles to collide and go up to the excited state. But two particles can collide and briefly be in an excited state. That's a non-integrable interaction. And then as long as they all end up in, back in the, in the vibrational ground state, then the sum of these things are, uh, is non-integrable. So therefore, you have this diffraction, diffractive collision, and you might thermalize. In fact, they calculated originally, and, and uh, with some modifications at a later part, and, and Glassman calculated a similar thing, uh, you can calculate what the rate is for those collisions. So there's a excited state, you mean internal or like a motional state in the, in the, in the trap? I mean a, a motional transverse excited okay. state. Okay. Right, so they're all in the 1D system, this is leaving 1D for a uh, brief time. Okay, and uh, so what we really want to do then in our experiment is we want to measure this diffractive collision rate because we can't measure what the thing is doing at infinite time, but we can get at what is the diffractive collision rate, and then we can compare it to this theory and uh, see if uh, just a little bit of uh, diffractive collision then just leads to uh, a little bit of thermalization on a time scale, which is just proportional to this, uh, this diffractive term, right? Or is something else going on? Now, in order to do that, in order to keep track of that, what we have to do is we have to understand everything which is happening during the evolution. So it's heating from all mechanisms, and I say heating because it's a nearly integrable system. So heating is not like normal heating. You know, it totally depends on how you put the energy in the system, uh, and uh, you know all the details of this process. It's just like not like dumping heat. It's more like transforming the system from one state to another using some stochastic noise process. And then there's free body loss. And then where we're going to get this from is evaporative cooling, because if there are diffractive free body collisions, they will lead to thermalization, and that will lead to evaporative cooling. So we're trying to keep track of all these three energy changing mechanisms, and uh, and then uh, get the answer about this diffractive rate. Okay, so uh, you know we had already started doing this experiment a while ago, and we've come back to it time to time uh, since then. The various things that we've done is we've decreased the heating from the initial experiment. We've increased the density. We've reduced the interactions that they have, so we can get a clearer picture of the momentum distribution. And uh, we, in particular, really are short of strictly enforced 1D dynamics. So two particles here, if they're in the uh, vibrational ground state, and this is the axial trap, this is the vibrational ground state direction, vibrational state direction, they don't have enough energy to excite to the first state that they can go there by parity, which is the n equals 2 state. Right, so uh, there's no way to get out of this system due to a collision. Right, so that's that's the strictly enforced 1D dynamics. They can't collide out of that system. <coughs> uh, there is a possibility of exciting through other processes, heating processes, out of that band. But if they do excite out, then uh, they uh, will either get lost, and I'll show you in a moment, or, or uh, they can put energy in the system, but in a way which you can calculate. Okay, so uh, here's a slide only really meant to scare you, because <laughs> I'm not going to talk about any of this. There's a lot of different things, details of these experiments that you have to worry about. And uh, we've 
sort of cycle through all of them. Uh, and in each case, you have to know how big is it or how much energy is deposited and exactly how is the energy deposited. Because if you deposit in one way, it's uh, more damaging in other ways. Anyway, we had to worry about all these things. It turns out, overwhelmingly, the largest problem is uh, spontaneous emission leaving the transverse excitation. So uh, w although we include, we keep track of all these things that go along, we really essentially barely have to because uh, this is what most of that evolution is due to. So what is that? It's that uh, particles from the ground state can spontaneously emit a photon and get excited to the transverse, some transverse excited state. And if it's there, it's pretty much sterile. It can't collide, it can collide with these atoms, but it can't be excited. But if you get two of them up over there, then they can collide and either they're lost, which happens sometime, or they're over there, they collide, and one of them is lost and the other one ends up there, just depending on the frame that they've collided, ends up in the ground state, but with some extra kinetic energy. Right, so that's the weight kinetic energy is put into the system from this process. So, uh, and all that stuff can be calculated a priori. So what we do is we treat this axial motion semi-classically, which is okay because the, uh, the uh, interaction energy is so small. And uh, we Monte Carlo simulate all these processes, but mostly that process, transverse excitations, uh, to see how they deposit the energy. And then the plan is to look at the heating at low density where there's no three body processes and see if we can, through this modeling, really be sure that we've got the heating right for this system. And then, then when we look at higher density, any extra evolution is going to be due to these density dependent processes. Okay, so this is what the Monte Carlo looks like partly. You've got to follow a whole lot of particles and they change internal states, they change vibrational states. Not that often, but a little bit, and then, then you uh, follow what's going on. It would be an impossible problem, except for that you can ignore all the two-body collisions because nothing happens in a two-body collision. Right, so I mean, all the two-body collisions, we don't have any three-body collisions this process, but all the two-body collisions except those that will change the rotational state and you know, with uh, and any random excitation to, to those rotational states. Okay, that's so a classical Monte Carlo? It's a, it's, a, it's, a class, it's a semi classical in the sense that the 1D trajectories are classical, but all the transverse this stuff is quantum yeah. mechanical. Okay. So that's a typical picture of the momentum distribution. Uh, over time, during the low density evolution, it goes from blue to, to red over time. See, it doesn't change by much under these circumstances. What we can do is we can take this and we can deconvolve that momentum distribution to get the distribution of peak amplitudes. And in that process, you get something where you can sort of see a little bit more clearly what's going on, that it's this kind of non-thermal shape that you're starting off with, with uh, you know that peak which is left over from the Newton's cradle excitation, and then it gra gradually evolves over time. Then you look at a distribution like that, you can look at the atom number as a function of time, you look at the energy change as a function of time. This cut off in the end is because you throw all the other ones away? Or it's, it's because there's a sharp edge to the trap. Oh, because you trap, they run... The, no, the trap has an edge. Edge, okay, so, so right. everything that's high momentum would just run out of it. Right. Yeah. There, there is, at the level of about part in 10 to the 4 of the atoms, there are some subtleties for dealing with this at the end, which... Anyway, we didn't talk about it. Yeah, no, no one else is going to want to hear it, but it's pretty robust. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, anyway, you have that, and then you run the Monte Carlo simulation. Monte Carlo simulation is just doesn't have free parameters. You just run it. You know, the dominant term is you know there's there's essentially no free parameters. There's one free parameter associated with the uh, with the fluctuation of lattice intensity at about the part in ten of the five level, and uh, what that does is it slightly changes what the asymptotic energy is. It has no effect over here, which is where we really care about it, but it can change it by a little bit over there. So essentially no free parameters for the Monte Carlo. And then the Monte Carlo result for the loss is this, you know, so the loss is coming from that spontaneous emission. Loss and then is coming from the heating. It's coming from the spontaneous emission leading to the heating. heating. Okay. Right, but so the loss is really from the, the part which doesn't heat, but the part that's lost. And the heating is coming from these. What's, what's the wavelength laser? of your lattice laser? It's uh, 772. Okay, yeah. Man. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and then there again, no uh, free parameters. There. And then we do the same thing at high density. That's the experiment. That's the Monte Carlo. You see the energy uh, matches extremely well in this uh, 
early region, which is something which is not obvious, but it should do that. And the loss isn't accounted for. I mean, the uh, the um, lo the uh, extra loss, the three, the losses coming in the experiment from the from the heating, but the loss due to free body collision is not accounted for. But if you just sh uh, shift that down, you see the asymptotic time is accounted for by the heating, and then this is three body loss at the beginning. Okay, so. What it seems like here, there's no reason that this should have been this way, is that all the heating is accounted for by the Monte Carlo. But we know there's free body loss, and the free body loss leads to heating. To what degree, we don't know yet. But uh, the, um, the uh, evaporative pooling is also part of it. So all we know from this is the sum of the evaporative pooling and the heating due to loss seems like it's essentially nothing. Okay, so now we have to consider what the free body loss is. And uh, if you look, as the thing changes the function of time, uh, we can get this uh, heuristic fit about some effective free body loss rate. We, uh, in the end, we know that uh, there's this loss rate, and we had the previous calculation that I showed you for the diffractive collisions, and the ratio of those is about a factor of three for this system. So uh, we, we need to find out exactly how much of this loss there is by looking at the data in order to extract this. And it turns out, it's more complicated than we might expect. I mean, naively, you say, okay, well, in three dimensions, three body loss doesn't depend on any anything. You know, it doesn't depend on energy. You just calculate it based on the density. But in 1D, it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, so it turns out to depend on my energy. So what we do is we do Newton's cradles with variable energy. We just diffract at a quarter cycle. We remove a lot of the energy, and then uh, we diffract in deep lattice, remove the energy, and then let it evolve. So we can have Newton's cradles with different initial average energies. And then as a function of the average energy, if you look at this effective free body loss, you see these, each color is a different lattice depth, that there's a strong energy dependence. Right? So the likelihood of a collision depends upon the center of mass energy of, that, of the particles that are involved in that free body collision. Okay, uh, here I show you the experimental data. We have a loss model, which are the uh, not the boxes, but the little triangles there. And the loss model, we can get it to fit with two parameters, this whole thing. We're not going to have a lot of time to talk about the loss model. i just give you an idea. We know the momentum distribution. We know the distribution of peak momentum. So we can infer all the individual loss processes that occur between every different momentum group at every point in space. Give that a, a, a center mass energy collision. Uh, it's a slightly more complicated functional form. And then this, we keep track of all the free body collisions that occur in this experiment. When you do, we find the best fit for k free one d at the various lattice steps is this. Again, it's just two free parameters. And uh, and then and just to go back, you know, then you get this thing which fits with all the lost data. Okay, so we have a model that keeps track of all the the uh, the those uh, inelastic collisions, and then we have an evaporation model which. Say, say if we scale the rate of diffractive collision by the rate of inelastic collisions, and we know at each diffractive collision, we know what the distribution of final states can be. It's uh, in PY, PX, PZ state, it looks like a uh, intersection of a sphere <coughs> and a plane, the sphere for energy conservation, the plane for momentum conservation. And, uh, and therefore, we can calculate the uh, amount of uh, of, uh, you know, we, we assume the amount of, of diffractive collisions based on the theory, then we can calculate how much evaporative pulling we expect from that. Again, keeping track of all the individual collision processes. So we're almost there. The, uh, just to remind you, this is what, it, this is what the energy changed out with the, with the low density in the Monte Carlo and the high density Monte Carlo. So it seemed like there was nothing left. So it just had to be that the sum of the two collisions, the one that we sort of relatively directly measured, which is the, the collision due to loss, and the one that we're just speculating that we know what the answer is for diffractive collisions. Th these are recent, so it's not in the prettiest form. So this is just a part of the initial data over here. The red is the heating due to loss that we calculate based upon what, what we have to get, this energy-dependent loss. And then the green is the cooling from evaporation. And uh, we, we still have to do this, but you sum these things up and it's within the noise of uh, 
what this is actually, I think this is a little bit overstated from the way that the calculation is done. It should be just a little bit smaller. So uh, you sum those up together and you get almost no change, which is consistent with this. Right, so first, a couple of things that that tells us is one, this is the first place anywhere, I assume, that anyone's ever measured a diffractive elastic free body collision. Because how can you ever measure a diffractive elastic free body collision? You can't turn off uh, two body collisions, elastic collisions. So it's first measurement of that. And the second thing is that at least now it seems, and we still need to just go over all our data, we have a lot more data than what I showed you and check for the consistency, it seems that the rate is consistent with what you predict from uh, the, just the model of uh, a little bit of an non leads to a slow rate of thermalization and that's it, just that's the only thing that's going on. Anyway, we're working to quantify the sensitivity a little bit better and uh, we have a couple of ways to boost the sensitivity a little bit, mostly by boosting the uh, density just a little bit more. Okay, so uh, I, what I've told you is that we have this uh, 1D gas which follows the lead linear model. The non we can see the out of equilibrium gas start to thermalize. And it seems like that thermalization rate is, uh, is just the simplest thing. You know, the thing that we'd say there's no, no special thing associated with being near interval point. And then, at least as far as this is concerned, it doesn't seem like there's a quantum KM thing, but there are other